All right, so where do we leave off last day? Uh, last day, we were talking about viruses and what they are in terms of their structure and a little bit about how we might classify these things. So they, um, of course, uh, have many different structures. They have um, different types of genomes. We're gonna talk a little bit about genomes today in terms of you know RNA versus DNA viruses. And we're gonna start talking about, there's, uh, there's, there's six viruses that we're gonna kind of feature in this topic, uh, at least six virus families. Turns out to be about nine viruses total. Some of them we've actually talked about a little bit here and there already, and uh, most of them we're going to talk about again in, in other units too. So uh, we'll see uh, what we can learn about those. And uh, I think I have a Kahoot timed for about uh, three quarters of the way through the lecture too. And, and uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot of interesting things. Um, I don't think we're going to quite make it to coronaviruses today, uh, but uh, I think there's probably a lot of people interested in that, of course. So as I, I think I finished off on this slide last day and mentioned that there is a committee that apparently handles virus classification called the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. And uh, so uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has heard of them, but I've been hearing a lot about them, particularly last year when they were trying to name this, uh, this new virus. So we'll talk about coronaviruses, like I said, maybe not quite today, but uh, definitely next day if we don't make it there today. So one thing about them, um, is that there's about 100 families of viruses. And uh, if you look at virus classification versus classification of normal organisms, you know, we, I know in the first week of classes, we were talking about, you know, you start off with domain and you work your way down through kingdom and phylum and all those kind of things. Uh, we don't necessarily do that with, uh, with viruses. Um, with viruses, we kind of just group them in families. So what they've done is they've grouped them into 100 families. And I'll give you some examples. For example, there's this family of the Rio Viridae. And uh, these viruses connect both uh, respiratory and, um, and the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, all of them are, um, are DNA viruses. And uh, they have icosahedral capsids and they have the same genome. So this is usually what they do is they classify them based on some of those criteria that I mentioned, you know, the shape and the, and the genome. And, um, and usually the family uh, of viruses does infect uh, uh, you know, only one or two kind of uh, uh, tissues. So there are uh, viruses um, in that family here uh, that infect humans. And uh, we're not gonna talk about rotaviruses a lot uh, in this class. I think I mentioned it once or twice, but this is something that people get a, a vaccine for as a child. And uh, so there's, there's A, B, and C and so on. And, and sometimes they have different pathologies and things like that. So the, this is a list of the viruses we are going to talk about, though, uh, in, uh, in this unit. Uh, family one is the uh, Papillomoviridae. <laughs> so it's a lot of syllables to try to fit in one word. Uh, family two are the herpes viridae. So we've talked about them just a little bit already. And those are both uh, DNA viruses. Um, we're not going to talk about the single-stranded uh, DNA viruses uh, in this class, anyway. Uh, group three is the Rhabdoviridae. I think that's how you say that. Uh, and that includes the rabies virus. And um, group four is the Orthomyxoviridae. That includes the influenza viruses, so the flu virus. Family five is the coronaviruses. And family six are the retroviruses, including HIV. So we're going to get to them. Not quite right yet, but just uh, to show you that I've, uh, I've tried to select some viruses from, um, from different. Uh, uh, genomes in different groups. Just trying to get my PowerPoint. There we go. All right. So back to this slide here. Uh, we were talking about these particular uh, um, processes in the cells, right? Replication, transcription, and translation. And uh, it's important to understand a little bit about what's going on here uh, when we're trying to understand what's going on with the viruses. So you may remember this, this is what applies to cells. So viruses are acellular, they don't have cells. So they don't have to do all this fancy stuff here. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, it turns out there's different families of viruses and, and this is yet another way to classify viruses, mostly based on genome. And this is called the Baltimore system. 
And this is kind of what most people are using nowadays is really thinking about these seven groups because um, if you know which group they fall in, uh, you automatically know quite a bit about their life cycle. And uh, by the way, you, you don't need to know all the seven groups, but uh, there's kind of one main principle I'm going to just tell you about here in a moment. So group one are the double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, that one's pretty straightforward, I hope. You start off with double-stranded DNA, and uh, the, the double-stranded DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is translated into a protein sequence, and that's done by the host ribosome. Group two are single-stranded DNA viruses. So they have to throw in an extra step. Uh, when they infect the cell, they have to convert their DNA to double-stranded DNA, and then they go to messenger RNA and proteins. Uh, group three are double-stranded RNA viruses, so they skip the DNA step entirely. Uh, we also have single-stranded RNA viruses, and uh, I'm, uh, you can see there, there's a couple of different types there, group four and group five. And you can see that we have the plus-stranded, single-stranded DNA viruses. And uh, I had mentioned, so there's the plus and the minus. And uh, I'll show you how those work in a minute. And uh, as I mentioned before, the, the DNA has two strands. So um, it's kind of uh, that RNA, that plus-stranded RNA virus is, looks a lot like the plus DNA strand, whereas the minus looks like the minus strand. So it's just a way for virologists to distinguish what exactly is going on. Uh, and you can see that sometimes it involves extra steps. Uh, there's also the uh, retroviruses, and they start off with RNA, and that RNA gets converted into double-stranded DNA. So this is kind of weird. It's backwards, going from RNA to DNA. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And a classic example of that is HIV. And we also have double-stranded DNA viruses that go through a, a different RNA intermediate for some reason. So this is the key fact. Um, don't need to know all the, all the seven groups. But the key fact is that all viruses need to make messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is going to be read by host ribosomes, and it's going to make viral proteins and viral parts. Um, so different ways to do this. You can have DNA or RNA genomes. You can have single-stranded or double-stranded genomes. And sometimes that involves um, extra steps. Sometimes you're skipping a step. Sometimes it involves uh, host um, enzymes sometimes involves enzymes that the virus brings in itself. So lots of different strategies. And I'll, I'll kind of show you, uh, yeah, that was weird. Those were just supposed to pop up. Uh, so I'll show you uh, some of the strategies for these, um, uh, these sample viruses here that uh, we're going to talk about in, in these six groups. So you can see, like I said, I was trying to grab a variety of different viruses that are, that are very relevant and, um, and have different viral strategies or replication strategies. So let me just show you kind of a little bit more detail about how um, these viruses might do what they're doing. And uh, keep in mind that the point here is that key fact, right? You have, uh, you have different types of genomes and the whole goal is to make messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is gonna be used uh, by the host ribosomes to basically make virus components. So DNA viruses, hopefully this is um, so, like I said, I'm going to look at, at these ones here. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let, let's take a look at these double-stranded DNA viruses for a second, and I'll show you a, kind of a quick example. So if you imagine, this is kind of what we did on the, uh, on the whiteboard um, the other day. There are the Word document, whatever I used. Um, you have DNA, and there's my DNA genome. Notice I put a plus and a minus. And uh, the plus, by the way, as I mentioned, if you... Uh, you're interested in genetics, the plus has the start codon, which is that ATG. So what happens is that the uh, messenger RNA is made. You can see the messenger RNA has the start codon. So remember that RNA has U instead of T, uh, but other than that, it looks just like the plus strand. So there's the messenger RNA, the host ribosomes uh, come along and they grab that messenger RNA and they make viral proteins. And uh, of course the genome also has to be copied and that's going to be uh, uh, an extra step. All that is basically uh, put together and you're going to assemble your virus. So there's DNA viruses, pretty straightforward, hopefully. 
So by the way, I'm not, I'm not gonna expect, uh, I'm not gonna ask you questions about all, all these steps and all that, but uh, um, like I said, remember that key point, the whole idea of getting instructions to the cell and the cell is gonna make more viruses and there's different strategies to do it. So single strand RNA viruses, uh, they skip the DNA step. So there we go, go right to translation, uh, make viral proteins, uh, the genome usually has to get copied. Uh, sometimes that involves actually making uh, a negative copy of the genome, which can then get transcribed into a plus copy, which becomes new genomes. And there we go. And so that is what is done in poliovirus. So we're not talking about poliovirus today. Uh, we will talk about it uh, later on in the course. Uh, so just uh, keep in mind that's a good example of that. Um, negative stranded RNA genomes. Um, it, it doesn't look like the messenger RNA yet. So they actually have to uh, make a, an, a copy, uh, a complementary copy. So remember U pairs with A, A pairs with U, C pairs with G. So usually this is done by a viral uh, enzyme. And, uh, and then of course we get translation. We gotta copy our genome and it's kind of, there we go. One more I want to show you is the retrovirus. We're going to talk a lot about retroviruses when we talk about HIV. And the retroviruses, as I mentioned, they start off with RNA. And RNA is made into DNA, double-stranded DNA. So remember, transcription is where we go from DNA and we make messenger RNA. So reverse transcri transcription is the, is the opposite of that, which is kind of backwards, right? So you're going from single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA, which is kind of a kind of a weird way to do things. But you know what? It's working for HIV. So uh, I guess uh, you know what it, it works. So who am I to criticize? So after that, uh, and we'll talk about what this copying and integration uh, looks like uh, when we talk about HIV, which will probably be uh, next Tuesday. Uh, Eventually, messenger RNA is made, and then that's read by host ribosomes to make viral proteins. Somewhere in there, uh, those strands are used as genomes, and you get your virus particles. So I know that's a lot, a lot of different strategies. Like I said, don't get caught up in all the differences there. Like I said, that you've got some key facts. All these uh, viruses have to make messenger RNA, and uh, they have different types of genomes, and uh, in order to make new virus particles, it's going to use a combination of uh, host enzymes and sometimes viral enzymes as well. So there's that key fact. I keep repeating it. So like I said, don't get caught up in all of the different methods, but remember this key fact. And like I said, we're talking about host and or virus enzymes in order to get the job done. All right, so moving on, I wanna uh, kind of just show you how some of these virus life cycles work in terms of uh, what's going on in the cell. Um, but uh, I guess before I get, I get to there, I should mention, uh, I guess, I, I, guess uh, I didn't realize I had this slide next here. Um, but one thing to know is that viruses uh, infect certain types of cells. Um, some of them are very, very, very specific. Uh, so HIV is an example of a virus that is super specific in that it not only just infects only human cells, doesn't infect uh, you know, chimpanzees or rats or bunnies or anything like that, and only a specific type of human cell, which is the CD4 uh, T lymphocytes, their type of white blood cell. And uh, so very, very specific. Um, T4 bacteriophage, uh, that is a virus that infects uh, E. coli only, and so does not infect humans. So also very, very specific. Uh, some viruses are a little bit more uh, promiscuous. Uh, influenza viruses kind of fall into that category. And uh, um, so they infect humans, birds, and pigs, uh, influenza A, and possibly seals. I can't quite remember. Uh, so you can see that's a, a variety of, of different types of animals. Uh, humans and pigs are obviously mammals, but birds are, are very, very different. And then there are some viruses that are very, very promiscuous, meaning they can uh, infect a wide uh, host range. And so rabies virus is a good example of that, whereas if you are a mammal, uh, rabies seems to be able to infect you. Uh, and usually you're looking at carnivores and things like that, but uh, uh, if you're another type of mammal, uh, like squirrels can get rabies, for example, it happens every once in a while. 
and uh, they can get infected. All right, so back to uh, the bacteriophage. I know I had mentioned them last day as a, as a type of virus. It's kind of a unique type of virus in that it has, uh, it's complex. You've got this uh, capsid and, and genome found up here in the head. And then you have this uh, tail, which is kind of like a, a syringe or, or delivery device. And uh, so bacteriophage, by the way, bacteria means bacteria and phage means eater or eating. So eater of bacteria, that's kind of a cool name. And uh, a lot of what we've learned about viruses is actually learned in, in bacteriophage. Uh, they're super easy to grow. Uh, they're, they're not infectious to humans. And so uh, when, when you're reading textbooks, uh, there, there's a lot of the virus stuff they've actually learned in bacteriophage. And, and uh, can't remember if the, uh, of this textbook in particular, but they, even some of the images are showing bacteriophage all over the place. So just wanted to mention that, that some of these things I'm gonna talk about uh, have been learned in bacteriophage. And sometimes what is going on in the animal viruses is, is a little bit more murky in terms of we don't quite understand the details quite as clearly. Uh, there on the right is uh, bacteriophage uh, T4 infecting E. coli. And that E. coli cell is not going to last much longer. <laughs> it's not in good shape. Uh, just for fun, I want to show you that there's many types of bacteriophage, just like there are many types of viruses. And here's a few. This is called lambophage, not PM2. It's not a very great name. And BL2, also not a very interesting name. And then my favorite are the corn dog bacteriophage. And uh, they look like little corn dogs. So that, of course, is lots of fun. So here's a little, um, a little video I'm going to play for you. And uh, uh, it's kind of going to show a virus infecting a cell uh, and, and very quickly, and then we'll kind of pick apart some of the details here in a moment. So let me play that for you. So there's E. coli, unsuspecting. If you look carefully, you're going to see some phage, some viruses uh, in the, um, in the uh, solution there. And there it comes. So it's got those tail fibers, and those tail fibers are very specific. They recognize something on the surface of E. coli. I think it's a glycoprotein or something like that. And um, and then, and then there it goes. There's the genome getting injected into the E. coli cell. And um, so the instructions are in there. About 100 minutes later, uh, the E. coli cell is um, uh, releasing uh, hundreds of, of new viral viruses. Um, yeah, so that's kind of very basic, right? Um, and let's just take a look at some of the details a little bit more here. So let's take a look. Uh, I want to talk about three types of basic uh, virus life cycles. And uh, these, these three types uh, are kind of the basics. And then sometimes there's a little bit more complication based on you know, what the virus is actually doing. And, and, and there's a lot of nuance in there. But this is an important part to understanding viruses and exactly what, uh, what they're doing. And, um, and, and each family might have a different way of doing so. So the very first step, I alluded to it in that video, is that um, the virus attaches. So there's something on the surface of the virus. It could be a spike protein or a glycoprotein, or in the case of that E. coli virus, um, a tail fiber. And it, and it specifically recognizes something on the host. So it could be um, um, some sort of uh, you know, a glycoprotein or, or, a, or carbohydrate. It could be some sort of a surface protein on that cell. And that's why the virus is specific to the host and specific often to the cell type. And so it attaches. And, uh, and then at that point, it um, gets in somehow. Uh, and we'll talk about entry strategies uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, but basically it gets in, and the main thing is that the genome gets in somehow. And uh, in animal cells, it could be the cytoplasm that the genome needs to get to. Uh, sometimes it could be the nucleus. I'm not gonna focus on that right now. Um, but basically the genome gets in somehow. And uh, the viral genome is used to make messenger RNA. So as I mentioned, there are seven strategies on how to do that. And uh, the messenger RNA is made. So the messenger RNA, of course, is instructions. And those instructions basically say, synthesize more virus parts and also more virus genomes. So all these parts uh, get synthesized. The, uh, the cell has become um, basically a virus factory. And uh, eventually they assemble and uh, they assemble um, 
somewhat uh, randomly, and, and we know this because people have analyzed these things and find out that there's a, a lot of virus particles actually aren't, aren't functional, um, but exactly how they do that is some, somewhat spontaneous and still kind of poorly understood. But, uh, you know, if you're looking at a typical virus, uh, you, you know, it, it could be, uh, uh, I, I think average now, average is kind of a funny number because some of these things take a long time to do, to do this. We're talking about weeks. Um, but the average virus is 100 to 200 minutes or something like that in terms of uh, infection to replication. Uh, but like I said, some can be much, much longer. And, uh, and then they, they eventually um, release virus particles. So this is called the lytic cycle, by the way. And that word lytic, that word lytic means uh, something like breaking. And so uh, in the lytic cycle, you can see the end of the lytic cycle is that the virus breaks open the cell and the cell dies, and those new viruses, they're gonna go on and they're gonna infect um, new cells. Uh, and that breaking process, of course, is where you get cell damage. And, uh, and this is where often you see the pathology of the virus, meaning this is how it's actually causing harm to the, to the, uh, the organism and, and causing disease. And that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit more um, later on today. So this is the lytic cycle. Like I said, you've got this uh, um, infection, uh, synthesis, and then release kind of thing going on. And uh, this isn't the only way that viruses can, can, uh, can replicate. Uh, some of them uh, have a different kind of life cycle called the lysogenic cycle. So lysogenic, I'd have to look that up to see exactly what the word means. It means something like sleeping. So take a look at this. Uh, the very first steps are the same, right? You have some sort of attachment where the virus is recognizing uh, the host cell and then entry. And um, but it doesn't start. Um, it doesn't start uh, uh, replicating right away. Instead, what happens is that the virus genome integrates into the host genome. So this integration step, uh, you can see in my diagram here. Here's the virus genome. And the virus genome gets into the nucleus and the virus genome um, literally attaches to the host genome. And so the virus and the host kind of become one. Um, and then that host cell, well, the host cell might divide and live its life. And, um, and, and this can go on for quite some time. So this is where you get uh, different types of viruses. Uh, there's different ways they be can become latent, uh, but this is one method and they, they, they're not doing really much right now uh, other than hiding in the host. And this is how you get some uh, viruses uh, leading to lifelong infections. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those examples as they come up. So this could go on for quite some time, could be short, could be years. Um, and then eventually at some point uh, that virus might start uh, expressing itself. So the, that uh, step is called induction. And uh, how the virus does that, sometimes it's actually poorly understood. Um, this seems to be the case um, with like herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two, they cause cold sores. And uh, in the initial infection is in your um, uh, in skin tissue uh, and epithelial tissue, and that's a lytic cycle. But uh, sometimes, you know, they, they get deeper in and they get into the nerve ganglia. And in the nerve cells, they enter some sort of lysogenic cycle that unfortunately is not really that well understood. Um, but at some point in, in many people's cases, they do reactivate. And um, in, in, um, in experiments, uh, UV light apparently works. Uh, we don't know whether that's an activation in, in humans. Uh, sometimes it has something to do with, uh, you know, when your immune system is kind of, uh, uh, you know, not uh, fully functional, you're, you're sick with something else, which is kind of why they're called cold sores, because sometimes people have them flare up when they get colds. Um, but uh, this induction process, and, and it's, it's really well understood in bacteriophage, um, not really well understood in, in, in humans, uh, why um, viruses stay hidden for as long as they do. And then uh, once it's induced, the virus goes through uh, basically a, a lytic cycle. So you can see you've got the uh, synthesis of the virus uh, parts, you have the um, um, assembly, and then the release, and then the, the cycle. Uh, repeats. So two strategies, right? Uh, produce new viruses right away, 
or hide for a while and sleep or, or whatever you want to call it, sleep or hide or go latent, uh, lots of words you can use for that. All right, so there's one other um, virus life cycle I want to show you, which is kind of a, a modification of this. And this is the retroviruses. And I had mentioned this already, that this is the case with HIV. So HIV, of course, is human immunodeficiency virus. And we're going to talk about it more next day. That's the virus that is responsible for AIDS. And um, it is a RNA virus. So if you take a look, there's our first step is the uh, infection and entry and all that. In this case, you get a single strand of RNA going in. And uh, so this virus undergoes something called reverse transcription. So the single-stranded RNA right here uh, is converted to double-stranded DNA. So the, um, the virus itself has an enzyme, and we're going to talk about that next day. It's called reverse transcriptase. Just trying to squeeze that in there. I was writing too big. Uh, and then the rest of it is a little bit like the lysogenic cycle where you end up with an integration and uh, it becomes a lifelong infection. And then it eventually goes through uh, the rest of the replication cycle. So just kind of an extra step there with retroviruses because they are RNA viruses. Uh, something I didn't point out with the lysogenic cycle is that when you have that integration event, um, that viral genome has a name, it's called a provirus. So if you ever see that, it just means that it's a, it's a viral a genome that's been integrated into a host genome. So kind of something different here with HIV, but uh, those are kind of the three general strategies that viruses take to replicate. Like I said, uh, every virus has its own nuances and sometimes extra uh, you know, things going on. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those here and there. So I think I have a cartoon here for you. Uh, types of viral replication. So, um, a virus and a retrovirus. Uh, I see someone asked a question about what is integration. I'm hoping I answered that uh, in those previous slides. That's where the virus, of course, uh, the, the viral genome becomes a part of the host genome and, uh, and then that lifelong infection comes along. Sorry, I missed your question there. So I just want to talk a little bit more about um, these life cycles and kind of some things that can happen um, and uh, some of the things that may be essential for some viruses. Because of course, we're talking about us, we and we're animals, and so viruses need to infect animal cells. So animal cells do not have a cell wall. Uh, that actually makes it easier for viruses to get in, um, but we do have a nucleus. So some viruses may need to get to the nucleus, some may not. Uh, and there, there, there's quite a, a huge diversity with animal viruses. Um, many are enveloped, and uh, uh, probably because we don't have a cell wall and the envelope sometimes makes it easier to get in. And many are DNA viruses and many are RNA viruses. In fact, a lot of the new viruses that we've been seeing and talking about the last few years, the you know, Zika and coronaviruses are actually all RNA viruses. So um, there, there's lots of important viruses in all the families for animal cells. So I think I have a video here in a moment. Oh, maybe not yet, just ahead of myself. Just wanna talk about how they actually get in and how they get out of cells and uh, show you some examples. So direct penetration, endocytosis, and membrane fusion. I'll show you some example of each of these. So what does direct penetration mean? Um, it basically means that the virus binds, and you can see there uh, in that little graphic, uh, the virus binds, and kind of like the bacteriophage, uh, basically the genome is directly injected. So you can see there's a uh, an example there, and this is, this is in the case of like the papillomaviruses, and we'll talk about those in a minute. You can see the genome is getting in there, and, and now you have those instructions, they're inside the cell and, and, and ready to go. So that's direct penetration. A little less common than some of the other methods. Another method is something called um, endocytosis. So endo means, <clears throat> excuse me, endo means in, site means cell, and osis means the process of. So the process of getting into the cell, <laughs> kind of what it means. So if you take a look at, um, at what is going on here, you have, uh, you have this, uh, this virus here. So an example is the influenza virus and it binds the cell. And uh, 
what it does is the cell has, um, has mechanisms for bringing things in like food. And what it does is it forms this invagination or this little pocket uh, in its own membrane to bring that food in or whatever it's trying to bring in. And so what the virus does is it tricks the cell into thinking that, hey, this is food. So you can see there's that little invagination being formed and then eventually it goes in and it gets being put into a little uh, thing called an endosome. And, uh, and then eventually that's gonna uncoat and uh, release the virus. And so you can see that example there on the left and, and two different ways of, of doing that on the right uh, from, the, uh, from the textbook. Uh, you can see on the right, the two examples, one of them what it looks like the one uh, B, the one on the left is just needs to go to the, um, the cytoplasm. The one on the right, it looks like is, is getting into the uh, nuclear membrane. Uh, and so needs to get into the nucleus. So one more method is something called membrane fusion. And uh, this is pretty common. Um, I think coronaviruses use this one as well, I'm not sure. Uh, in this case here, uh, they recognize the host cell and rather than getting brought in by uh, endocytosis is the, uh, the, the membrane or the uh, uh, um, envelope on the virus uh, actually fuses with the host membrane. So you can see in this case here, the, um, the host membrane and the, uh, the virus envelope kind of just fuse together. And then that in part, inside part, which contains the genome, goes in and there we go. And so now you have the capsid and genome in the cytoplasm. And usually what happens when these capsids hit the cytoplasm is they dissolve and that leaves the genome and the genome is now ready to be expressed by the host cell. So like I said, different strategies, uh, and you might see these things in your travels if you look at uh, uh, virus life cycles. And this is something that uh, a lot of uh, virologists at first take a look at when they're trying to understand the biology of these things. So something to think about, and now this is um, not always the case. Like I said, you know, with biology, we can kind of put the word usually in almost every sentence because there's always exceptions, but generally, DNA viruses, since they have DNA, all the host DNA enzymes are found in the nucleus. So DNA viruses usually have to find their way to the nucleus. RNA viruses don't need to do that because there are RNA viruses, or sorry, RNA enzymes and ribosomes are out in the cytoplasm. So they don't usually need to get the cytoplasm. So just kind of a, a, a general um, guideline, but not always the case. Um, the other thing that I've emphasized before already is that each virus uses a combination of host and viral enzymes for replication. Um, a lot of viruses bring some of their own enzymes, so they might bring their own DNA polymerase or their own RNA polymerase. Uh, coronaviruses and influenza viruses, for example, have their own RNA polymerases, and uh, that affects the biology of how they mutate and whatnot. And, and we'll, we'll touch on a mutation of, of those things a little bit later. So there's that key fact again. They all have to make messenger RNA. They can be read by ribosomes. Sometimes viruses have their own enzymes to help them along the way. Okay, just to time check. Okay, see where we are. I think we're about where we should be. Um, how do they get out of cells? Uh, kind of the same way as they get in. I mentioned the lysis. This is the breaking of the host cell. Uh, some of them exit by exocytosis, which is kind of like endocytosis in reverse, and many of them exit by budding. And so you can see on the right, here's how the budding works. You've got this virus particle, and on its way out, it grabs some membrane and uh, encodes itself with another extra layer. And so in the end, we call this an envelope. So you might see this term here, virion. Uh, it's kind of used interchangeably with virus. It kind of means, um, just a, a virus particle that's floating around without a host cell. Um, but I don't usually use that term so much because I'm trying not to confuse people with that. So here's, here's an, a nice uh, colorized uh, electron micrograph of the influenza virus budding away from a host cell. And uh, so it's bringing that host membrane and, uh, and, and you can sort of see on this picture, some of these surface proteins here, maybe here and here, and uh, those are actually virally uh, re uh, replicated proteins. Uh, you know, they're usually glycoproteins. Sometimes they call them spike proteins in certain uh, viruses, um, but they're usually involved in the infection process. And, uh, and when we look at some of our virus examples, we'll, 
we'll see a couple of examples of those kind of things. Influenza virus being a good example of that. All right. Oh, there's a question here, and then we'll we'll um, we'll do a kahoot. So um, someone is asking: Do immunizations prevent genomes from going inside the cell? Um, that's a good question. Um, immunizations, uh, um, in in many cases, are preventing infection. Uh, it's never 100%. Um, some vaccines are really good. Uh, the measles vaccine is a good example of where uh, it's very close to 100%. Um, in other cases, it's, it's a lot less. And uh, so um, what usually happens with an immunization is uh, if you're immunized, your immune system reacts really quickly. And uh, so in many cases, very few cells get infected, but there might be one or two, you know, a few get infected. Whereas if you don't have the immunization, um, your immune response, uh, without immunization, your immune response usually takes several days as opposed to like hours. And so more cells are getting infected. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. I'm gonna load up this Kahoot now. And uh, so you can get the app ready. I just gotta find my web browser here and then share it with you guys. I see there's another question here. Somebody's asking about what the difference between budding off and exocyte, exocytosis. They both produce vesicles and all of them. Yeah, it's, it's kind of more in the details. I'm not gonna, it's not something I'd ever ask you to do it. It's more in the details of how it's done. Uh, in the budding, the, um, um, the envelope is captured uh, uh, literally on the way out. The endocytosis uh, or the exocytosis, um, it's actually bound in a membrane before it, it actually gets to the host uh, cell membrane. So, um, I'm sure there's probably somebody who's put a video up there on uh, on YouTube somewhere, but uh, um, I can I can discuss it with you some other time if you like. Probably haven't shared the Kahoot yet, so let me just um, do that. Change my screen. There we go. You should be able to see it now. So Kahoot game pin is three six six five two four two, and I think I have six or eight questions this time. All right, I'll give you about 10 more seconds here. All right, let's begin. Question one, can viruses re reproduce independently? So no, viruses need a host cell. So hopefully that was an easy one. Um, this is kind of basics around viruses. Is that, is that you can't just feed them food. Uh, they, they need a host cell of some sort in order to uh, reproduce themselves. All right, number two, what are the main components of a virus? So the correct answer is DNA or RNA in a capsid. So remember that was a key thing to know about virus classification is that uh, viruses have uh, uh, DNA or RNA, not both. So that makes uh, the red one and the yellow one incorrect. And, um, and they always have um, a protein coat and that's what the capsid is. Some viruses do have um, a membrane-like thing that we call envelope, but not many. All right, we'll take a closer look at the scoreboard after we ask a few more questions. What is the capsid around the viral genome made of? Just answer that.
Okay, so we added a protein. Well done. Okay, question four. Viruses can infect any organism. So false, yeah, they have a host range. So good job. A few people got tricked up on that one. Um, I, I don't maybe I didn't word the question as well as I could have. Um, all organisms probably have viruses that infect them, but a particular virus can only usually infect a particular organism or a range. Like I said, rabies is kind of one of those weird ones that can infect all mammals, but they can't, can't infect anything else. Okay, let's see how the scoreboard is doing. Okay, so we have some people staying at the top, well done. All right, number five, which cycle is this? So this is the lysogenic cycle. So take a look at this, uh, this little part here down at the bottom, replication of genetic material the, and incorporation. That is uh, key to realize that that is the, um, the lysogenic cycle. Um, so maybe not the best image, but you better read all the, um, all the details carefully. Uh, by the way, I see somebody is asking me a question whether the lytic and lysogenic uh, processes are interchangeable. Um, I'm not sure if I quite understand the question. Um, but uh, um, basically every virus has its own way of doing things. Uh, they will either usually use a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. And if you have the lysogenic cycle, there is the lytic component to it. Um, but uh, in the case of herpes viruses, it seems that depending on the, on the tissue type, they might use one strategy or another, um, but that's atypical. Usually most viruses have one way of doing things. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, Kind of the way it works. It's like this virus here, the coronaviruses, for example, this is what they do and this is what they always do is usually the case. Okay, so a couple more questions left. Um, what is an integrated piece of viral DNA called? So the correct answer is a provirus. This is where the uh, genome of the virus is integrated, incorporated in the host genome, and it's called a provirus. Question seven, which animal virus has the enzyme reverse transcriptase? So I've mentioned this at least twice already. So actually, well done. That was a little bit of a harder question because um, we haven't really gone into the virus examples so much. I've just been mentioning them here and there. Um, but this is a retrovirus uh, and this is uh, HIV. And again, much more on HIV um, in, in the next uh, lecture. Okay, so it looks like Shelby is on a hot streak. So let's see if she can maintain the lead. Question eight. What is a well-known retrovirus that negatively impacts humans? Did I just give you that answer? I think I did. <laughs> so well done. Uh, it looks like 39 people were listening. Um, one person, I don't know who that was, sorry. Uh, you missed a little detail there. Okay, so we all wanna know, did Shelby, Shelby get the goal? Um, Good job for bronze, Ruba Rush, I think. Silver, precious, well done. We knew you were doing well and... All right, well done, Shelby, congratulations. Okay. So I'll stop there. And um, I think I mentioned before that uh, I was going to uh, post the cahoots up on, um, on Moodle and I've done so. So if you wanna review them, uh, you can do so at any time. Uh, they don't necessarily cover everything. Um, I'm sort of designing the cahoots to, uh, you know, usually I'm trying to throw them in mid-lecture to kind of wake people up again and, and give us some, a little bit more interaction.
Um, so they're not necessarily going to cover all of, all of each topic. So before we get into the virus examples, I want to kind of just talk about different types of virus infections. And um, we've kind of actually sort of talked about this a little bit in some details here and there already, but kind of just want to define a few things. The number one is lytic. So we're talking about lytic. That's where the virus is killing cells, right? And the killing of cells leads to what we call cytopathic effects. So that means that that virus is damaging that tissue and leads to disease in that tissue. So a cold sores are a good example of that. That's herpes simplex one usually, sometimes herpes simplex two, and it's damaging tissue in the, um, you know, in, in the in the epithelial and the skin and, and the layers just underneath, and causing these blisters. Uh, influenza viruses causes the flu, and people cough and. Uh, and, and then that is from the virus getting down into your respiratory system and actually damaging cells all down, uh, all down that system. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these are, these are from lytic effects from those viruses. So that's something that's usually pretty obvious. This virus affects this tissue, causes um, disease in that tissue. Um, some virus infections we call chronic or persistent. Um, and uh, this is where the virus is infecting the host for the long term. And uh, sometimes it causes disease and discomfort. Sometimes it's not necessarily noticed. Uh, this is different from latent, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because usually this means that the virus is being shed and the person might be infectious, right? So uh, you can see a whole bunch of examples there, right? We have uh, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, two of the hepatitis viruses, uh, HIV uh, infection. So this means the person could infect somebody uh, at, at any time during that infection. And chronic could mean um, weeks, it could mean years. Uh, it kind of depends on the situation there. Some of these viruses listed in that list, like HIV is a lifelong infection, uh, can be controlled with drugs nowadays. Um, you know, uh, same thing with uh, herpes infections and, and things like that. Um, but uh, uh, so, so that's kind of what chronic means. And like I said, the severity of the disease can be varied from asymptomatic to uh, you know, where somebody is, is suffering kind of constantly. Latent is more of the sleeping, where the virus really is hiding and inactive. And um, herpes simplex viruses are another example of this, uh, where, like I said, they can hide in the nerve ganglia, and, um, and they can be inactive, and they can be inactive for days, months, years kind of thing, and uh, they're not replicating, they're kind of hiding. And uh, this is uh, in some cases due to that lysogenic cycle. There are other methods of latency. And uh, in many cases, it's not really well understood. And I think that's the case with the herpes simplex viruses is that we can, you know, there's, there's studies in, in cell culture, um, but how that translates to what's going on in the human body is a little bit harder to, um, harder to determine. All right, see so there's a question here. And uh, somebody's asking about, would this be an example of, of COVID shedding? A COVID isn't latent, as far as I know. Uh, it goes through, uh, goes through a basic uh, lytic cycle, and uh, it replicates for several days. So I think the average person who has COVID uh, is infectious from uh, two to five days. And uh, that means the virus is replicating in, uh, in you know, mostly the respiratory, but sometimes the vasculatory system. And uh, as it's replicating, it's, it's uh, you know, the word shedding just means it's, it's uh, being released by the human. And uh, eventually, it gets cleared um, by the uh, immune system, or in, in some cases, you know, the person doesn't survive, right? And that's, uh, that's where the infection ends as well. But it's not chronic. Um, uh, it's not. It doesn't hide anywhere that that we know of. I haven't heard of any cases of anything like that. But good question. Uh, last one. Uh, this should be. I go A B C C C two Cs. This should be B oncogenic. Uh, some viral infections form tumors, and uh, we'll we'll talk about this shortly here. Um, here's an example of a viral infection causing tumors. Um, so these have been found uh, in the wild. Uh, uh, these um, these rabbits with uh, they kind of look like horns, uh, and, and it turns out they're not horns. Um, these are actually really gigantic warts, and um, and what is a wart? A wart is a, a small tumor. In some cases, um, it can turn to cancer. And we'll talk about the difference between tumors and cancer here in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, 
Um, just wanted to show you some pictures of uh, some other warts. And uh, these are found, of course, on, um, on all sorts of animals. There's uh, the dog in the top left there, uh, a deer at the bottom, and uh, a cow in, in the right. And of course, humans get warts as well. And um, <laughs> I know people were probably thinking, oh no, what kind of warty picture is he going to show today? Um, I, <laughs> you know, I, I thought that this one was kind of funny. So this is a Halloween costume you can get. And of course, there's the whole um, uh, stereotype that witches have big warts on their noses. So it's Halloween costume you can get. Obviously, I'm interested in Halloween costumes. I didn't realize that. So um, this brings us to um, our, uh, our examples of human diseases. And um, the first one uh, is actually the one that causes, uh, can cause uh, tumors and cancer. We'll talk about that in a moment. Somebody's asking, is herpes both chronic and latent? Um, I wouldn't use the word chronic for herpes viruses uh, because chronic usually means that there are symptoms ongoing or, or viral shedding ongoing. So more or less it hides, it's latent for a while, then it flares up and sheds for a while, causes disease and then goes away. So chronic, like I said, is sort of more of the constant shedding, constant disease, whereas herpes viruses, uh, they go latent, which means they really are kind of dormant and, and not replicate. So let's get into these. Uh, I'm not sure how far we'll make it through the list. Uh, definitely cover the first couple, I think. And, uh, and then uh, that would leave the, the last few for, uh, for next Tuesday. Uh, so let's talk about these. Uh, some of them I've talked about a little bit here and there already. Uh, some of them uh, I'm gonna talk about now. The first one, let's talk about warts. Everyone wants to talk about warts, don't they? Um, warts are not caused by toads. Um, toads can be warty, toads can be smooth, toads are fun to catch in the summertime. And uh, I know some people think they're cute, I think they're cute, and some people are terrified of them, <laughs> but they don't cause warts. Um, what causes warts are papillomaviruses. Uh, I know that's a bit of a mouthful. It's papilloma virus. So it actually, it does roll off the tongue if you say it a couple of times. And uh, so there's, there's what the papilloma virus looks like. And uh, this is the cause of warts in humans. And uh, most people get warts at some point in their lifetime. Uh, a little more common in children, but uh, happens in adults. And um, most of the time they are, um, you know, benign, meaning they're harmless. Uh, you know, unless you have them in an uncomfortable place. Um, I think around grade seven, I had a wart on the bottom of my foot. Um, that wasn't fun because, you know, you're using your feet all the time, you're stepping on it. And it kind of was, uh, I wouldn't say painful, but just annoying for the most part. And uh, in many cases, uh, people get infected and, and they don't even know. Um, so like I said, you, usually benign. There's, uh, I think, around 100 and 70 different papillomaviruses that infect humans. And, and so they're called the human papillomaviruses. And, uh, and, and so uh, not all warts, um, of course, are, um, are found everywhere. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but uh, so often you might call these HPV, oops, H for human. And often uh, people associate HPV with genital warts. So it turns out, like I said, there's the number, about 170 types, and uh, about 30 or 40 uh, can cause uh, genital warts. Um, but HPV doesn't have to be genital warts. Like I said, that's the one that people are most concerned about because of course it's a sexually transmitted disease. And uh, this is the other big thing here is that some of these types can cause different types of human cancers. And so uh, of course, um, we don't like cancer. Cancer can be really bad for you. Um, warts, uh, uh, these viruses um, can, uh, sorry, just a second here. I just uh, noticed an important message about my car's getting fixed. Uh, so warts infect uh, skin and mucosa cells. And, uh, and like I said, they cause little tiny tumors. And we'll talk about what a, what a tumor is in a moment. So you can see this is an example of a double-stranded DNA virus. It's non-enveloped, hinders by direct penetration. I think I actually have the life cycle right here. Uh, I'm not going to expect you to know all the details of the life cycle, but uh, I, I do find them kind of interesting. You can see in this case here, it's a it's a uh, it's a DNA virus, and uh, and the DNA uh, uncoats, 
and, uh, and does um, get into the, um, the cell nucleus, which is uh, pretty common with DNA viruses. So it goes through a, kind of a, a cycle. Um, some of the cells die through a lytic cycle. Some of the cells uh, um, get mutated and in the case of, of uh, and, and they call them tumors. And we'll talk about what a tumor is here in a moment. I've got that on another slide. Uh, so like I said, often when people say HPV, they do mean the, the, um, the, the 30 to 40 ones that do cause uh, uh, genital warts. Um, and um, this is a very, very common sexually transmitted infection. Uh, it's estimated that somewhere around 70 to 80% of humans get this uh, at some point in their lifetime, or let me correct myself, 70 to 80% of humans who are sexually active get this in their lifetime. Um, obviously, if, uh, uh, being a sexually transmitted infection, um, that's, that's the risk. So it's, it's a lot less likely to happen before somebody becomes sexually active. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these strains are the causes of uh, some human cancers. The one that we hear the most about is cervical cancer, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the good news is we have some vaccines for this, the HPV vaccine, and uh, that's been uh, out now for... I'm just trying to think, about 15 years. So that means probably most of you are, um, are young enough to have had it going, uh, had the vaccine uh, going through the school system. And I think they give it to you around grade five or six, somewhere, somewhere in there. And uh, so let's, let's talk about those vaccines for a minute. Uh, let's talk about what, uh, what cancer is for a moment. Um, so I, I told you I was gonna define what uh, cancer in a, a tumor is, right? So tumor is this mass of, of constantly dividing cells. And so a tumor can be benign or malignant. So benign means harmless. So most people have tumors. Um, a lot of us have moles on our skin. Um, there are tumors uh, inside your body. Sometimes they're very, very tiny, uh, not even detectable without uh, you know, biopsy or microscope or something like that. And many are, many are benign. Cancer is where they get uncontrolled and can start causing uh, disease. So if you have a um, you know, um, cancerous tumor uh, you know, in, in, a, in a critical part of your body, your liver or your brain or your heart or something like that, it can cause serious disease. And of course, there are many types of human cancers out there, breast cancer, lung cancer, skin cancer, brain cancer, et cetera. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a whole big lecture, potentially. Uh, we just want to talk a little bit about cancers caused by viruses here. So by the way, um, Viruses uh, are believed to be responsible for about maybe 20 to 25 percent of human cancers. Um, so that's huge. That's a big chunk of human cancers that are out there. Uh, cancers, of course, are caused by other carcinogens. So the, the most famous carcinogens, of course, are cigarette smoking uh, and, and other chemicals and uh, UV radiation. And uh, but there are other kind of carcinogens out there, a big long list of, of things that can potentially cause cancers. And of course, this is something that we're very interested in because um, here's a cancer statistic for you. Half of us will have cancer in our lifetime. It's about 48% uh, of Canadians will have cancer in their lifetime. Uh, and, uh, and everybody knows somebody who has had or been affected by cancer. Um, so it's a very important kind of, kind of issue. So let's talk about these viruses. Um, there are um, quite a few pathogens out there that are associated with, uh, with human cancers. I'm not going to list them all. Uh, here's some of them. And uh, you can see, for example, uh, the hepatitis viruses here, B and C, are associated with liver cancers. We're going to talk about hepatitis viruses kind of, I think it's probably the last lecture of the course. So we won't worry about them today. Uh, what we are talking about today is HPV. So the human papillomaviruses, and there are a few associated with cancers, particularly type 16 and type 18 are the most well associated with cancers. And you can see they're actually associated with quite a few different types of cancers. I know there's a lot of talk about cervical cancer, but um, that's not the only part um, of the body associated with sexual activity. So any part of the body associated with sexual, sexual activity can actually be um, uh, affected by uh, HPV-induced cancers. So that includes the vagina, penises, uh, people involved in, uh, in, in oral sex. Uh, it can involve the throat uh, and, and those kind of things. Um, so you can see a big long list there. 
We are going to talk about Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, I think we're going to get it today, and it's, it's associated with some uh, uh, different types of lymphomas, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. You can see there's a few other things on here. I, uh, these last few things are not actually viruses, uh, but there are pathogens that are associated with different types of cancers, and um, so just something for the list there. So uh, back to HPV, um, if you're a woman, uh, you probably know a little bit about pap tests. Uh, pap tests are, um, are little tests that are, are looking at uh, your cervix to, uh, to look, for, um, uh, look for cervical cancer. And so pap tests are usually recommended uh, uh, with women, um, you know, once they uh, become sexually active or, or when you, you reach a certain age, and um, kind of uh, what it does is, is they're, uh, they're basically scraping a few cells off your cervix. Um, I'm sure that's not comfortable. And then, um, and then what they're doing is, is basically throwing them under a microscope to take a look at them. And uh, so you can see here's a little um, cartoon showing a normal cervix and something that is, uh, is getting cancerous or precancerous. And uh, if you take a look at this, these, these normal cells um, are, um, well, they're normal looking. So they're kind of a, a typical uh, size and uh, they have a typical size of nucleus. Um, and, and so, you know, under the, uh, the PAP test, you know, they, they look like something like that under the microscope. Uh, the cancers or precancerous ones, uh, they, they end up being uh, kind of different sizes. Some are small, some are big. They end up with sometimes uh, multiple nuclei or large nuclei, and, and you can see they, are, they have a, a very um, uh, distinct look and uh, easily detectable under a microscope. Uh, nowadays, this is uh, actually automated, by the way, and uh, I, there's a computer that actually looks at it and, and analyzes it, and, and any positive results are, of course, confirmed by a technician. So let's just talk about those vaccines for a minute. Um, I mentioned they've been out for about 15 years. I think they came out in 2006 or something like that. And um, initially, um, these vaccines came out. Um, so th these are all the uh, options that are available in Canada, by the way. Uh, and the initial vaccine uh, that came out in Canada was actually Gardasil. And Gardasil uh, protects against uh, four types of uh, papillomaviruses. And uh, initially, it actually was only uh, marketed and, and given to, uh, to girls in Canada. And um, I guess the whole thought was, well, uh, first of all, um, this is an expensive vaccine. The government didn't want to pay for everybody, I suppose. And, uh, but the actual original reason is that uh, the vaccine was designed thinking about cervical cancer. So who, of course, has a cervix? Girls do, not boys. So they were vaccinating girls in the trials and the vaccine was actually only approved for girls initially. So it took several more years before the vaccines were actually approved for boys. Because of course, it doesn't take people long to realize that if this is a sexually transmitted infection, it might take two individuals to spread it back and forth. And there are of course, um, different types of, uh, of cancers besides cervical cancer. Uh, there are cancers on, on the male body parts as well. Um, so now we have, um, I think mostly these first two have been discontinued because we now have Gardasil 9 and Gardasil 9 actually protects against nine types of, um, of HPV. And uh, some of those are associated with cancer and some of them are associated with uh, genital warts. And these are the most common types. You can see that's effective against about 90% um, of, uh, of the cervical cancers that we're seeing out there. I see somebody has a question and um, she says, why is there an age range on the vaccinations for HPV? Um, probably because those are the age ranges that the vaccines were tested in. Uh, that's usually how you get approval for uh, any drug or vaccine is, it, is uh, it goes through testing and they test a certain age range. And I guess the whole idea um, is that uh, the, the whole strategy, they wanna vaccinate girl, girls in about, I think, I think it's grade five or six. And um, so the idea is you want to, of course, you know, get people protected before they are sexually active. Um, and, uh, and, and I guess presumably um, by mid twenties, uh, you know, people might be with one partner kind of thing uh, for life or something. I, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that has something to do with the ages that's been tested. 
Um, I don't know whether if you're older than that, if you can get the vaccine or not, it's, it might be worth asking if you're, if you're interested in something like that. Um, I think, do I have, how well does the vaccine work? Um, so usually with cancers, uh, cancers can take decades. And uh, the thought was we wouldn't know how effective these, va these vaccines would be for at least 20 years. Um, but it turns out that we actually have lots of good data all over the world now. There are several Canadian studies. I was reading about one in Scotland, one in Australia, one in the UK. Uh, and uh, we're already seeing uh, amazing results from, from this vaccine uh, worldwide uh, and uh, massive decreases in, in uh, cervical and anal cancers, which is incredible. This is, this is good news. I like it when there's good news. All right. so. Um, that's it for HPV for now. We might bring it up here or there again, um, but this is a good example of a vaccine um, that is preventing a cancer. And uh, like I said, a good success story. And uh, also a good example of a virus that, that causes cancer. And um, so I like to see that we have a relatively preventable method of getting rid of at least one type of human cancer. All right, so group two, this will probably be where I might be where we finish today. I wanted to talk a little bit more detail about um, the herpes viruses. So I had kind of introduced viruses by talking about herpes viruses and um, want to kind of just go into them in a little bit more detail here. So these are also DNA viruses, but these ones are enveloped. So that's different from the papillomaviruses. These are enveloped and they, they enter by uh, membrane fusion. So um, as I mentioned, there are eight herpes, human herpes viruses, and they're all famous for uh, latent infections and that can be dormant for a long, long time. So I think I had told you that herpes viruses are uh, lifelong infections. So once you get it, uh, you're stuck with it for life. Um, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to uh, you know, have issues with it. There are some of these that go latent for all of your life. If you've ever had infectious mononucleosis, um, I think it's very rare, but most people have the uh, disease and illness once, and then, and then that's it. Um, same thing with chickenpox, um, although we'll talk about chickenpox is kind of an interesting, um, uh, I don't know if I want to call it an exception, but there's something weird that happens with that sometimes. Uh, so this is uh, showing um, the life cycle, at least the fusion. You can see we've got a, a membrane or envelope. Oops, yes. Sometimes you touch the screen and it's fickle. So uh, there's the envelope there. You can see the fusion, the, um, the uh, envelope of the, uh, the virus uh, fuses and becomes uh, one with the uh, host membrane. And then the host genome gets in there. And in this case here, um, it's not showing it. And I can't quite remember, but I think it does also have to get to the nucleus. And in some cases, like I said, in some cell types, um, um, herpes simplex viruses at least uh, do become uh, lysogenic by integrating into the host. Uh, this diagram does show that um, the, the messenger RNA being made, that's used to make some proteins. Some proteins are made in the endoplasmic reticulum and they become uh, these uh, glycoproteins and these glycoproteins end up on the, uh, on the, uh, the virus when it, uh, when it buds away. So as I mentioned before, there are eight human herpes viruses and uh, you need to know one, two, three, and four. Okay, the uh, five, six, seven, and eight, only if it's part of your project, uh, I'm not gonna come back to, to those ones. Uh, they're just not uh, usually that serious or significant in most people. Um, but, uh, so let, let's talk about these ones here. So uh, human herpes virus one and human herpes virus two are the simplex viruses and they cause cold sores and genital herpes. Um, so there's some pictures. If you're looking for some horrifying pictures, you know, um, <laughs> this is the one to search. Uh, um, <laughs> search up herpes and, and there's, there's lots of horrifying pictures on the internet of, um, of people who have suffered from it. Um, so a couple of things about them. Uh, cold sores uh, are usually caused by herpes simplex one and sometimes number two. General herpes are usually caused by herpes simplex two and sometimes herpes simplex one. Uh, I'm not sure what the ratio is. It could be 90%, 10%, I'm not really sure. Uh, but the viruses are very, very similar and they like that kind of tissue. Um, I don't really know in terms of the structure what's, what you know, um, 
sort of uh, mouth tissue is, is sort of spongier and softer and, and similar to uh, genital tissue, of course. And uh, so these viruses uh, have the ability and, and are able to infect those areas. Uh, sometimes people end up with herpes simplex infections in other parts of the body. Uh, there's ocular her herpes uh, where it gets into the eye. Uh, and there's some evidence that in, in some people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's that it's actually getting into the brain. Um, so kind of some interesting uh, things going on there and, and whatnot. So these are really common. Um, herpes simplex one, we're looking at maybe 60% of the human population, genital herpes, herpes simplex two, um, 10 to 15, maybe 20% of the human population. So very, very common. Uh, cold sores um, are usually obtained uh, when you are a child. And they're usually obtained by, well, you know, people love kissing babies, right? And uh, people don't know that they're shedding virus. Uh, so if you're somebody who has cold sores, um, just avoid kissing people when they're flaring up. Uh, that would kind of be the best uh, piece of advice. Uh, and uh, um, same, and genital herpes are usually acquired uh, when people become sexually active. And uh, same thing, um, people are most infectious when they're flaring up. Um, although sometimes they, they don't know they're about to flare up. Uh, unfortunately, lifelong infections, and uh, both of them can be, uh, you know, embarrassing and whatnot uh, at, the, at the wrong times. Um, not, not fun to have these things, but there are antiviral medications that can actually cause these things to, uh, uh, you know, at least the symptoms to go away because it prevents a viral replication. So I'll tell you um, a, a quick story about, uh, about uh, herpes medication here. Um, but somebody has a question. Somebody's asking about impetigo. Impetigo is actually caused by a bacterium. It's a bacterial skin infection. So it is different from the herpes virus. Good question. Um, so my, my son had, um, had warts uh, between his toes. And uh, because the toes are constantly rubbing with, uh, between each other, uh, the warts weren't going away. You know, he, they gave him the acid treatment and, and all that. And it was, it was just this ongoing thing of these terrible warts between his toes. And, um, so uh, they're like, okay, well, let's, let's try some, some antiviral medication. And uh, so my wife comes home and she's like, oh, I was so embarrassed. I, I mean, they prescribed me, prescribed our son some, uh, some herpes virus medication, right? And, 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 she, and anyway, I mean, there's only so many antivirals out there, antiviral medications. And, and so it's the same medication that was being used for um, the warts on his feet that would be used for people with uh, um, general herpes or cold sores. Uh, I can't remember which one it was called. It's called like Herbex or something. So it's pretty obvious in the box what the, what the uh, medication is, is primarily used, used for. All right, so the next human herpes virus, human herpes virus number three is called varicella zoster. You know, I've never actually looked it up as to where those words come from. I think they might be Latin or something like that. Um, so this is famous for causing chicken pox. This is a very old, human disease. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, it used to be a childhood kind of rite of passage. Uh, most people would kind of get it somewhere around the beginning of when they started going to school. So maybe kindergarten or something like that. Um, sometimes people wouldn't get it right away, maybe up till age 12. Um, pretty common. 95% of people would get this. You get the, you get the spots. Um, this child here has it pretty bad. Uh, I remember having chicken pox in kindergarten. Um, I have um, a scar on my belly uh, from having chicken pox. Um, and uh, uh, I know somebody who has a chicken pox scar uh, right on, on his forehead. <laughs> um, so, you know, that was kind of usually the worst of it, being itchy, uh, not being allowed to go just, you know, see your friends for a while. Um, sometimes there are, uh, are complications. People, it, the infection can get in, is in the respiratory tract. And, and in some cases, people can hospitalize and, and die. Um, that's pretty rare with chicken pox, but it does happen. And uh, like I said, it was kind of a rite of passage. Um, but now we have a vaccine for this. And uh, so again, looking at age in terms of thinking about how old you folks are, um, if you are roughly, uh, age 20 or younger, uh, you probably had this as part of your routine vaccinations as a child. Um, again, depends on which province and whatnot you were, you were living in. And uh, um, not necessarily the case. Uh, um, I, my son ended up getting chicken pox before he got the vaccine. Uh, 
so um, so he was kind of an exception on that as well. Um, and uh, so this here is a herpes virus, and uh, it lives in you forever. And so in some rare cases, uh, people get chickenpox twice. But what often happens is that uh, later in life, you don't get chickenpox, you get a different kind of symptom called shingles. And uh, this is super common um, and more and more common the older you get. So I'm not exactly sure where the risk is higher. I think it's around age 60, uh, the risk is higher and it gets higher as you approach uh, older you know, 80s and, and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure what percentage of people uh, get shingles who've had chickenpox. Um, and it can be also minor or it can be very, very painful. Um, I know, um, I don't even know how many people I know who've had shingles. I, I have a colleague of mine and he's, um, I don't know how old he is. I'm not going to ask how old he is. I think he's around 70 and he had shingles about three years ago. And um, he was out of work for about a week. Um, and that's not bad actually for shingles. Because I have another colleague who had shingles when he was around 45, and he was off week or something like, or off of work for something like three weeks. Um, so uh, it, it varies. Uh, I remember when my father had shingles, he was off work for about three weeks, and he, uh, I don't know if he had a rash, I never asked him, um, but I think he had a lot of pain. And like I had mentioned that these viruses, sometimes they go into the nerve ganglia. And so this is the case where it's in the nerves and, uh, and, and causing uh, a lot of pain and, and discomfort. When someone has shingles, they can be uh, infectious and they can give you the virus. So I just gonna go back and there's, um, there's a couple of questions and comments. Um, someone is asking, should they know the virus is chickenpox or var varicella zoster? You should know both. And someone has a comment that says uh, neutropenic patients get shingles. Yeah, so it's 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 pretty common. Um, someone's asking, does the rash from shingles leave after the infection passes? Uh, it, it can leave scarring in some severe cases. Uh, I'm not too familiar about it. I know um, some of the people I know who have had shingles, uh, none of them had a rash this bad. Um, and uh, uh, I think the big thing was the fatigue and the pain. Uh, was the was the big issue that they had. Uh, so somebody is saying at 50, they recommend getting the shingles vaccine. Is it the same vaccine as chicken pox and essentially a booster? Um, yeah, so the age has changed. Um, it used to be over 65. And I think over the last few years, they've been dropping it more and more. Um, and uh, so um, it could be 50 now that they're recommending uh, you get the shingles vaccine for sure. And like I said, I've known at least three people who had it at age less than 50, one guy in his 30s. Um, so um, it happens, right? Um, it's essentially the same vaccine. I think it actually has a different name. So I don't know whether it's a different concentration or, or um, what the formulation is. Um, probably has a lot to do with, like I said, when you're doing the uh, research for vaccines and you're uh, going through the clinical trials, um, you know, and the marketing and all that, right? So, you know, sometimes they call one thing that might be called, you know, the, the brand name might be called, uh, you know, something like chicken pox vax, and the other one might be shing vax because they're, they're technically marketing to different populations. Um, but there are a few different versions of the, uh, of the vaccine out there, but they're essentially the same. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like a booster, right? If you, you know, um, for most people that are at that age of 50, they did not have the vaccine when they were younger. They had chicken pox when they were younger. And so, um, so this is the case, right? They're getting a, you know, they had natural immunity and now they're getting a booster from the vaccine. So someone's saying, can shingles be transmitted to chicken pox in an unvaccinated child? Yes, shingles is infectious. So this is kind of a common way that some people might get it for visiting grandma. She has shingles and then they, uh, they get the virus and they end up with chicken pox. Someone says, if you got chicken pox when you were younger as well as the vaccine, would we have to get the vaccine again as an adult? Um, that's a good question. And this is the kind of thing that future research might actually show. Uh, so in terms of the immunity, um, it, it has good immunity, but you know, no immunity lasts forever. So if your immunity is, is let's say 40, 50 years, um, I think they're recommending you get the booster because the immunity after 40, 50 years for almost anything starts to wane. Um, 
someone told me that you can easily contract chickenpox from someone when they're about to get better. Is that true? Uh, it's, it's pretty infectious. And uh, I'll show you, I have one more slide, just hang with me for a minute. I'm just gonna finish, there's a lot of comments on this one. Someone says my mill had shingles when I was pregnant and their doctor said to stay away from me and be very careful. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with chicken pox, but I know uh, there are a lot of viruses like rubella and measles that can be um, actually really uh, significantly important um, when you're pregnant because you don't want them to get into the fetus. So it says here, why isn't immunization given later in life if it can cause shingles? Yeah, and that's that's why we're um, that's why we're giving the shingles vaccine to people when they're when they're 50 or 60 now. Uh, somebody said they still got the chickenpox vaccine when they were getting their nursing shots. And, uh, um, you know, sometimes when they do the immunizations, they're like, hey, well, you know, why not give you boosters for things now while we have you here? Uh, the reality is, if you look at human uh, behavior, uh, and we're seeing that now with vaccines, you know, there are people that are, you know, uh, totally against vaccines, and they don't even remember getting them as a child, um, and uh, not realizing how significant they've been in their life. So just bear with me. I'm just going to finish up here. I was just going to show you uh, kind of transmission on chicken pox. So you can see the virus is actually, um, it's airborne. Uh, and that's why you can't go to school and visit people because it's hugely infectious. Uh, not as infectious as measles, uh, much more infectious though than what you'd see with even COVID-19. Uh, and it goes into the respiratory system and then infects all sorts of systems. And of course, uh, what you do see is, is the rash on the skin but people are still breathing the virus in and out when they're, when they're infectious. So I think, let me just take a peek. That is it for chicken pox and, uh, and shingles. There's another uh, image of a rash. Yes, we didn't quite finish the herpes viruses, but we're out of time. So we'll talk about Epstein-Barr virus uh, next day. So thanks for all your questions and um, hopefully you have a great weekend and we'll see you all on Tuesday.